Welcome back to another episode of the Additive Snack Podcast. I'm your host, Fabian Alefeld, and today we have a special guest joining us, Laura Gilmore, founder and principal consultant at LG Strategies. Laura has an extensive experience in the additive manufacturing industry, in particular in the medical market. Today, we'll dive into additive manufacturing in that space. We'll talk about the current challenges of the medical industry adopting additive manufacturing. We'll talk about trends, and we'll also get a great overview of the industry as a whole. Welcome, Laura, to Additive Snack. Thank you, Fabian. I'm happy to be here joining you today. All right, before we dive into all those details that I just talked about, let's learn a bit more about you, Laura, and your journey into additive manufacturing. How did you get into that technology and how did you build your experience specifically in the medical market? Sure. It's funny when you look back at your experience and you see the things and how they all line up. And that certainly happened with me. It's been a definitely a unique journey. So I'm a biomedical engineer by training and I got a master's degree in that field. Mm -hmm. After that, I worked in the orthopedic industry for a few years and then started working with additive manufacturing in about 2010, which was about the time when additively manufactured components and orthopedic devices like permanent hip implants were being introduced to the market. Mm -hmm. So with that, I worked on R&D of porous coatings for those implants. So that's when you build the entire device in one shot with additive technology. Mm -hmm. And after that, I spent some time at the Food and Drug Administration. So I was a pre-market reviewer and looked at those types of devices. While I was there, I was one of the founding members of the Additive Manufacturing Working Group, which ultimately created the technical guidance document for additively manufactured devices that's used today. Mm -hmm. And then I spent some time at a major spinal company where I made custom or special instruments for special surgical technique or patient population for that particular surgeon. And part of my work there was bringing additive manufacturing into their business and guiding them in spinal applications for AM. And of course, then I moved on to EOS and was the global medical business development manager focusing in the healthcare space. Now I get to help many different customers figure out what's next with, with their devices and design control and regulatory and quality systems. So Awesome journey. And yeah, you really touched on every facet of that industry from medical device manufacturer to the FDA to a system OEM. And now you get the full spectrum of really getting details into various kinds of medical devices that are trying to leverage additive manufacturing to its full potential. And since you have such a good overview of the industry, what are some applications that are being printed today? And could you also touch on some verticals where additive manufacturing is making a significant impact and contribution today? Sure. Well, I think your audience, I'm sure, knows what AM technology is best suited for, right? The custom designs, combining multiple individual components into one and very complex structures. And all three of those are being taken advantage of in the healthcare industry. So to start, it's always interesting to remember for both the wider public and the medical device industry that hearing aids were actually one of the first disrupted industries by additive manufacturing. And even several years ago, around 98% of all hearing aids were made this way wow. because you're putting a specific design device custom to your ear. And so that's the world that was first one of the first disruptors. Mm -hmm. Another area is orthopedic implants and spinal implants. And orthopedic implants especially have been using the technology for more than a decade to create porous structures, which I talked about a little bit earlier. And the benefit of this structure is to the patient is that the patient's report that it makes those porous structures and the bone and growing into them, it makes it feel more like a natural hip or knee. So they're able to feel like they did before they had to have surgery. Mm -hmm. And so that application combines at least two components into one, but it also uses that intricate structure of making those reticulated porous structures for the bone to grow into. So a lot of people forget that too, that there's many of hundreds of thousands of 
orthopedic implants that are implanted into people today. So I think that's another milestone to yeah. share for and, sure. And how many of those just ballpark are leveraging additive fund affectioning today? All of those, like hundreds of thousands of 3D printed hips and knees. And it's not the whole thing. It'd be a part of a component of the entire implant device. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. And you mentioned hearing aids, and that's something that we really don't talk about enough in mm -hmm. the industry. Is there, is there a separate regulation for hearing aids that made that the first disruptor? Or is it truly all the benefits came in together, the technology was mature, and it was just ready to roll out at that time? Yes and no. I think both things are true. So if you're, if we dive into well, if we do surface level of what regulation looks like to start, you're looking at a risk benefit analysis. And so everything is regulated based on risk. Mm -hmm. And so something like a permanent implant is going to have a much higher risk than something that you're putting in your ear and able to take in and out. And if you know you have an irritation, you can take it out and that's okay. And, and you've mitigated that risk. Of course, you don't want that as a device developer, but it it's a lot a different bar, let's mm -hmm. say, than mm -hmm. an orthopedic implant. So I think it was a first, the controls are a little bit different. So it did give an opportunity to really disrupt something wow. without having every single device to go through a pre-market review. For Interesting. Example. Yeah, perfect so. example for true disruption. Sometimes people yeah. use the term disruption a bit too loosely, but it definitely yeah. Yeah. accounts for in this case. Okay, what else? So we talked about orthopedics, we what talked else? about the hearing aids. Where else do we see additive manufacturing making an impact? So there's a lot of instruments that are created using both polymer and metal materials. And so a lot of those are patient specific. So again, that custom aspect of using the technology. So some of those are maxillofacial procedures. So when you're reconstructing your jaw, for example, you take a bone, right? The standard of care is taking a bone from your femur or your hip and then putting that into your jaw to reconstruct it. And so those instruments are patient specific and can be created using additive manufacturing. And a lot of them are. And then along those same lines, there's a lot of dental applications that are additively manufactured. So you have a resin that you then take through a, a, a system and then print out the crowns or bridges or dentures or whatever it is. So there's quite a lot of dental applications as well. Mm -hmm. And then one that I think is really interesting that a lot of yeah, well, was new to me recently was radiotherapy devices. So if you imagine someone needing to get radiation therapy to shrink a tumor, mm -hmm. you want that radiation beam to go exactly where the tumor is and not touch any of the healthy tissue. So those radiotherapy devices use something, a material that makes sure that that radiotherapy beam only touches where that tumor is or as close to it as you can and keeps the surrounding tissue healthy. So that's a really important thing for the, for those patients, yeah. especially. Yeah. Yeah. And to also quite mature early on in the additive mm -hmm. manufacturing history that's only been around for 35 years. I think dental right after hearing aids were probably the second application that were adopted quite quickly and quite heavily. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that tracks well. I wasn't super involved in dental early on, so I missed that that wave and have just seen the end product really. So yeah, but it's interesting to see the innovations that have happened in the dental field for sure. Digital dentistry is now, I think, a buzz term that all dentists know at this point. Yeah. yeah. I remember I, I visited a dental lab in pre-COVID and they had a 24-hour turnaround time from receiving a file to shipping out the 3D printed product, which was some of them were, were crowned, some of them were more implant type applications, right. but 24 hours, that is very incredible, even for additive manufacturing, because you do have some yeah. post-processing efforts involved as well. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. What else? Yeah. Any other sectors that we should touch on? I think two more that I can think of off the top of my head, the process prosthetics, orthotics, and assistive tech. I kind of put those all together, even though there are some differences between the two, but they 
definitely take advantage of the ability of additive manufacturing to create a lot of one in a cost-effective way. If you're using making an assistive tech device for a certain patient that maybe needs a an adaptation to be able to chop wood, that would be different than potentially a patient that might need an adaptation to put on makeup, for example. So there's a wide variety of things that can be made using the assistive technology with a, a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. And then the last one, which isn't too common yet, but there are a couple of companies that have created 3D printed drugs. And so that's typically varying very specific doses dosage of the drug based on a patient's need. So that is out there. It's hmm. not super common, but it exists. So that's customizing ultimately the pill volume based on mm -hmm. the body weight of a patient. Is that how it works? Well, I don't know ex the exact chemistry behind it, but that's the impression I get. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about orthopedics. We talked about instruments, hearing aids, obviously, and dental applications that were quite early, prosthetics, orthotics. Those are all very different fields and have organizations behind them that don't even speak to each other. But I'm sure there's also some common challenges that all of these applications have gone through when their OEMs try to adopt additive manufacturing. What are some of the hurdles that, that you could share that you see in your daily job, but also have seen throughout your career that folk, folks get faced with when implementing additive manufacturing in the medical space? Yeah, so I think the main hurdle that people think about is regulatory. The regulatory bodies are the gatekeepers of getting those devices on the market. But there are a lot of there are a lot of areas that, that we talked about that may not need to go through a pre-market submission where a regulatory agency would actually look at the device submission. Some of those are much lower risk. We talked about that difference in risk. And so not all of those applications necessarily need to go into review by a regulatory body. So that is a challenge for some, but I think for all devices, one of the biggest challenges and another major stakeholder for getting something adopted on the market are the payers. So mm. it's challenging to get insurers to pay for something brand new. So, and some insurers have considered additively manufactured devices to be experimental and they don't cover them. So I think that's something that, that is is a hurdle that people don't think about from the technology side. And in fact, one one topic I didn't mention, which is probably the application that most people have seen are anatomical models for pre-procedural preoperative planning. And those anatomical models, they have they don't currently have a medical code that would allow for reimbursement. Hmm. But right now, the group, the Radiological Society of North America, or RSNA, they have a special interest group that's been working on getting a medical code or a CPT code created for additive or for anatomical models. And so they're building a registry with that and showing what the value is to the patient and to the medical community by making those anatomical models for those very complicated surgeries. So that process takes several years and it's still in an early phase, but that is an area I think that for some of the very new things or, or very innovative devices that it's difficult to necessarily, if you don't have, if you're not a hip implant, mm -hmm. right, or something that's very common, you might have some need to figure out what does that look like to get somebody to pay for this device. And in some cases, it's a philanthropic arm from a hospital. So the hospital charities that are getting donations that end up paying for those anatomical models, which really? I thought found very interesting. Mm -hmm. That is very interesting yeah. because it should be in the healthcare provider's interest to run a smooth and educated surgery with some tools that I can leverage in order to make sure I'm doing the right thing and I'm not a doctor either. But <laughs> if I were yeah. to run an organization that helps my team to be more efficient and reduce failure, that seems like a no-brainer. Yeah. Yeah. They like to see the evidence though. They want to see the data. They want it to be 10 years old and that it's consistent over a 10 year follow-up. And, and that's the struggle with medical device in general and how to show that something is a benefit to your patients. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned cost. Are there applications out there where additive manufacturing is actually more economic than conventional manufacturing? And if so, what are those? 
Yes, and that is one reason why the porous structure or porous coatings on some of the hip and knee and spinal implants, that process conventionally is a multi-step process and it's typically very expensive. It involves maybe shipping to multiple suppliers. So being able to bring it all in-house, build everything all at once, not having to worry about delamination or separation of the coating from the substrate is something, all of those are advantages to additive manufacturing and does bring the cost down. So yeah, it's definitely a, it was one of the reasons I think why people started going that direction in orthopedics. Yeah, that's really good to hear, right? I mean, oftentimes new technologies get adopted because there might be a performance increase or a, mm -hmm. a underlying reason of getting into additive or a new technology justifies potentially a higher cost. But in this case, we actually do right. see a cost reduction. We'll have a few orthopedic organizations on the show as well over the course of the next few weeks. And they'll also touch a bit more in depth on that vertical integration that is happening for some of yeah. those suppliers that gives them a huge advantage to, to really own their full supply chain and to be able to control mm -hmm. prioritization and cost and so on and so forth. That's a really good point. So we touched on the regulatory landscape already mm -hmm. a bit, but I would like to dive deeper into that because it, I think there's a lot of question marks still out there. What does the process look like of getting a additively manufactured device approved? And can you maybe compare it to a conventional application and point out those friction points that exist today? Sure, I can try. So as we mentioned, it's all based on risk benefit and there is typically a lot more focus on the risk than the benefit of a new device. But I, I strongly suggest people to also remember that we're doing this for a benefit for a patient and sometimes something that is risky, if the benefits better, then it's definitely something to pursue. So yeah, overall though, there are devices that are low risk and just need to follow something that's called general controls and good manufacturing practices. And so that is a, making sure that you're making the same part every time and you're making what you expected and you're showing that you've designed the thing that your customer wanted in the first place and then that you have made the same thing every time i mean even if it's a patient specific something you still want the the the, what they call a design envelope to be the same. You want it to be within certain parameters and certain specifications. Um, so that's part that's on the lower risk side. So that would be called a class one if we were getting to the weeds. But mm -hmm. there are also additively manufactured devices that are higher risk. And some of those may need to go through a clinical trial to claim, to show that the benefit outweighs the risk. And then there's some kind of in the middle where you're showing that your device is at least as good as something that's already on the market. And that's the, the common term, the 510K process. The, that's a pre-market submission that's called the 510K. And it's just related to a number of the, the code of federal regulations, blah, blah, blah. So, but overall, the guidance from the regulatory bodies is that the regulation for a device type is going to be the same no matter how it's manufactured. Mm -hmm. So practically, that means that the testing required for a specific device type should be completed the same way for an additively manufactured devices as for its conventionally manufactured counterparts. So okay. you're not given the device part of it is not given a different set of rules that it has to follow. It's the same set of rules. So for example, a hip stem is still going to have to have a torque testing mm -hmm. or those. So all of those types of things are the same. However, the FDA did publish a guidance document in 2017, and that covers the technical considerations for additively manufactured devices. So there are some additional questions that the FDA wants to understand with your device if it's additively manufactured, but this is more on the as because as we're building the the device, we're building the material it's mm -hmm. made out of, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not taking a forged something that we know what it is. It's very clear you're building the material it's made out of at the same time that you're making the device. And so that was a little concerning to the FDA in the beginning because they don't really 
know what that means. So there's a couple of things that need to be tracked based on that, Mm -hmm. that the FDA wants you to tell them how you've controlled these things. And so a couple of big buckets of what that looks like. So one is we're dealing with patient imaging a lot of times to make our patient specific device. Mm -hmm. And so you're manipulating that imaging data several times, right? So it might go from the where you're getting the image from, maybe it's a CT scan, for example, Mm -hmm. and then you're going to do something to reduce that data. So it's something that a design software can see and look at and it makes sense to it. And then you're gonna design the device according to that imaging information that you got. And then you're transferring that design to a sliced file that the AM system can read. And so there's a lot of data transfer points along that digital chain. And it might be multiple different companies that are making each one of those digital softwares that's manipulating the data. And so the FDA asks the device manufacturer to verify those critical attributes and performance criteria of that final device using their software workflow. So they want to make sure that what you started with is what you're ending up with. And so you have to demonstrate to them that there's nothing lost or unexpected in all of those image transfers. Interesting. So that's kind of a lot of... (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. but it makes sense. Yeah. And I'm sure this even accounts for other manufacturing technologies, right? Additive is not the only one who relies on CT data in order to manufacture a device and the digital workflows are getting more and more complex. Now, artificial intelligence, we don't want to even touch on, but that's another, <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, another aspect that is definitely going to join that mix and might make things a bit mm-hmm. more complicated. Okay. So that's the process for the digital workflow. Now, yep. one thing that's, I think interesting is at least Within our organization, we still talk about IQ, we talk about OQ, and we talk about PQ. So installation qualification of equipment, operational qualification of equipment, and then the performance qualification of a final application, really. Are those three steps Mm -hmm. still followed within a medical device manufacturer for additive manufacturing? And if so, what do they look like? Yes, it's definitely still followed. And it's also followed for your post-processing equipment and your cleaning equipment and your sterilization equipment, if you have it internally. So it is definitely part of the good manufacturing practices. So that landscape is important for even if you're not going in to the FDA with a 510k in your class one device, it doesn't need to be looked at by the 510k process. If you are required to do good manufacturing practices, all of those things still apply. So yeah, so the, it's very similar. Essentially, the concept is very similar to traditional manufacturing equipment. It's just the execution of it is a little bit different. And some of what that guidance document we talked about, some of the things that it asks for are could be addressed in your OQ or PQ, for example. One of the things that they really want to make sure that you understand for yourself is if we're using a process that has a way to reuse material, how is that Mm -hmm. reusing of material affecting the device at the end? So part of your worst case thinking behind what your worst case scenario is needs to also take into account the powder reuse strategy, potentially where it's built in the build volume and orientation support strategy. All of these things could change the way that your end product behaves. So you can either show, maybe it's with your within your OQ, um, that those things aren't affecting across the build platform, for example, or with coupon testing of chemistry or however you're thinking about it, that can be shown earlier on. And then you can reduce the testing that you need to do on the product itself, potentially. Mm-hmm. But all of those things need to be considered when you're thinking about your worst case for that specific device testing that we talked about before. So maybe it's the fatigue testing of the hip stem. So is there anything that would contribute to that worst case based on your additive manufacturing process itself and how the machine is behaving and understanding all the details behind how the system is working? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Thanks for for elaborating on that. I think it's it's an important piece of the puzzle to 
-hmm. to truly understand the machine capability, repeatability. And I think there's enough practices out there that, that help organizations also to, to get into the technology by leveraging some of these guidelines that exist. So we talked about challenges and there's obviously a lot, but there's a lot of upsides to, to additive as well in the medical space that we talked about a bit earlier. Now, what does that mean for the industry moving forward? Can you highlight some of the trends that you see in additive manufacturing in the medical industry that are starting to crystallize on the horizon? Sure. So I think one of the areas that, that we didn't really get into is that's a very big topic, at least of conversation, is point of care manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Lots of people are doing it. And to be fair to the clinicians, point of care technically means bedside. So we've taken a term and kind of loosely applied it. But I'm not familiar with any additive manufacturing technology that's technically used bedside, but unfortunately the Australian regulatory body coined that term and we're kind of stuck with it now. So yeah. that's what that, that means and kind of the history of where that came from. But within that world, there's a lot of really great benefits that, that you can have, right? You're typically for a medical device manufacturer, you know, you're an engineer that's working in a healthcare field, but you're not a surgeon, you're not a clinician, you're not a radiotherapist. So you need to go and talk to them and find out what is it, what are your pain points? What are your, what are your needs? Do the dis customer discovery conversations over and over and over again. And the benefit of being in a point of care facility or being in a hospital or a clinic is that you're right you're working right alongside those clinicians potentially every day. Mm -hmm. And so you're able to hear firsthand what are the pain points. You don't have to necessarily pay the clinicians to come tell you because you're on the same team. So that is, I think, the biggest benefit. And I'm really hopeful and see some that there could be some really interesting innovations coming out of that. And of course, the the FDA is concerned for public health and public safety, as is their job. And so they want to make sure that if you're getting a medical device made at a hospital, it's the same caliber of device that's made from medical device manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So that is still a clarification that needs to be made. But I do think it's coming in the near future as to what that might look like. But I do think the, the clinician and the engineer and the imager, the radi radiologist, for example, all of those people working together is a huge benefit to, to you know, bringing engineering into the hospital. Mm -hmm. And additive manufacturing enables them to do that, really. Yeah, I think one of the one of the organizations that's pretty public about it is the Mayo Clinic team. I see a lot of mm -hmm. presentations on various conferences. You and I yep. actually visited them quite some time back, and they have a very impressive engineering lab. They sure there. do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. for n nothing new to manufacture devices on site or instruments, I, I think in this case, but additive is a completely different animal. Right, yeah, exactly. Okay, so so point of care, obviously huge upsides, but there's still a lot of question marks marks on it. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure we'll get through them. What, what else is going on in the medical space that, that people should keep an eye out? One of the things that, you know, I really think is interesting is that integration of additive manufacturing into radiology. And so this is how radiologists have been the, the typically the starting point of an in hospital facility, but all of the radiotherapy devices that, that could be, there's, I think there's a lot of benefits to that and to having something that might be a little more comfortable for a patient that's specifically designed for them so their experience could be a little better. I think that is an area that there's a lot of opportunity mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. And then I mentioned this in another forum, but I'm becoming quite impressed with the bioprinting world and how far that has come along in the last several years. There's a bioprinted lung that was produced with I believe United Therapeutics, and they claim this is the most complicated 3D printed object ever built in history. So it's all the infrastructure of the, as I understand, the the lung itself, and I won't bore you with all the 
the details of it, but it's a very intricate structure. Yeah. And so that's super interesting. Of course, there's still a good bit of work to be done when you're trying to integrate multiple types of tissues together that would be necessary to print something like an organ. But there seems to be a lot of work on vascularization in 3D printed tissues. And I think there's some good movement in that direction, even though we've been saying for the last many years that it's the next thing. It's just been a very interesting thing to learn more about with bioprinting and how maybe the next best material for medical is cells, right? So super interesting. interesting. Mm -hmm. Can you explain just for a minute or two, how, how does that work? Well, so I am not, I am a novice at bioprinting, so I can't say that I'm an expert, but the, there's a couple different strategies that are out there. One, there's typically it's a plotter, a bio plotter, and then there's other technologies where they're suspending the cells and printing in a suspended space. So instead of air, it's a suspended media of some sort. And so that it, it's really as compared to like a eos very complicated system that is going to be in your industrial settings it's a little bit the machine itself could be a little bit simpler in terms of that it might be a desktop for example mm -hmm. you're not making airplane parts you're just making smaller <laughs> well, like things, organs. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but the interaction between the different cell types is the, is one of the important parts. And so you're usually doing some sort of incubation stage, at least right now, and that may change, but that, that is yeah, like I said, I don't have a whole lot of <laughs> diving into exactly how it all works. But yeah, I was working with a bioprinting group recently, and we were in a biology lab, and it's been since college that I've looked at pipetting. So <laughs> it's been a long time since I've done that, the, bio the true biology part of this, yeah. Yeah, super interesting. I actually also, I focused on, on biotech in my master's degree as well. So yeah, I'm very interested yeah. in that. And I think this kind of showcases that additive manufacturing is, it's just at the beginning of having mm -hmm. a, an impact into the medical space is that we've only been doing it for 10 years. So right. there's a lot, a lot to come. Laura, I want to thank you for being on Additive Snack. It was a pleasure to have you on the show. I hope yes, we'll do this you. again. Yeah, absolutely. would love to. Thank you, Fabian. Well, thanks everybody for joining this episode of Additive Snack. We delved into the world of additive manufacturing in the medical market with Laura Gilmore. We also talked about various different types of applications. We talked about challenges and trends in this exciting field. And as I just said, this is really just the beginning of additive's impact in healthcare. We hope you found this episode informative and inspiring. AM continues to revolutionize the medical market. It's opening doors for personalized care, improved outcomes for patients and innovative solutions. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to Additive Snack on your favorite platform, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and leave us a review. We appreciate your support and welcome feedback. So any suggestions are super welcome. Stay tuned for more captivating discussions, especially in this season for various players in the medical fields and I'll see you then.